We had quite the bullish move on Wall Street today with the S&P 500 up over 2%. In fact, over 90% of the companies within the S&P 500 closed in the green here today. It was a big win for the bulls. In particular, the financial sector really benefited from some news from Warren Buffett last night. Only one stock in the financial sector in the S&P 500 even closed in the red here today. All the rest were in the green. On the flip side, the consumer staples did struggle here today, led largely by one single name that you would not expect to make an extreme move. In fact, today's reaction was its worst day since 1987. I won't spoil the surprise for you, but we'll talk about it in tonight's video. Uh, and then we'll get into our trade application example where we wanted to talk about a different consumer staples company that's setting up nicely for a bounce up and off of its rising 30-day moving average and is showing nice improvements in our stock selector tool at marketscholars.com. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by marketscholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's May 17th, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into our description area and make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. Also at the bottom of those emails, you'll get all the stocks in the S&P 500 that are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. Uh, in fact, I just crossed the 12,000 follower mark here this afternoon. So if you're one of my newer followers, uh, welcome aboard. I hope I can add value to your uh, day. Uh, but if you're not following me yet, uh, I would encourage you to do so uh, as we try to keep the, the conversation going between these presentations while we're online there on social media. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see here from our heat map, it was quite the day for the bulls. Uh, up over 2% on the S&P 500, you can see why. It was a landslide victory uh, for those on the long side of the market. Yesterday was a bit of a quiet day, but this does kind of follow in the footsteps of what we saw on Friday as well. And of course, we've been waiting for some sort of a, a rally here uh, recently as we've been seeing all kinds of things like oversold cluster signals, right? We talked about here a couple of weeks ago the Nasdaq having its first oversold cluster signal on a weekly candle chart since 2018. And then the following week, the S&P 500 did the exact same thing, right? So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's just stretching the rubber band a little bit too far. And now it's snapping back a little bit uh, towards the moving averages. And as we've been mentioning, the real test will be what we do once we get back to those falling moving averages. And my expectations right now are that we fail at around those levels and that we'll struggle and we'll probably roll over again. I hope I'm wrong about that, uh, by the way, but uh, uh, we'll all find out together. And that's what makes the markets interesting. Every day gives us an opportunity to learn and to try to interpret what the market is trying to tell us. So today was a nice snapback rally. As you can see, it did affect the vast majority of sectors positively out there. There was one exception to that, and you can see there's one bright red square over here that just stands out like a sore thumb, kind of looks like the, the nose of uh, Rudolph uh, the reindeer. Uh, that's how bright that red is. And that is Walmart, probably the least uh, expected stock to be as extremely sold off as this. In fact, I heard on business news earlier today that this was Walmart's worst day since 1987. And that probably occurred during the entire stock market massacre that year. Uh, so this is an incredibly rare situation where Walmart was down 11% today alone. In fact, I had done some research on the dividend aristocrats from the 0809 crisis, and Walmart was, out of all of the aristocrats, the one that moved around the least amount and was able to get back to their prior highs the quickest. So uh, even in the worst of conditions like 0809, you usually don't see Walmart make huge movements to the downside. But today, there was an exception to that rule as they came out with earnings and Boy, oh boy, 
Wall, Wall, Wall Street did not want to have anything to do with them. So uh, Walmart down 11% here today, and that kind of set the tone for a lot of those other consumer staples companies there as well. You can see a number of them falling into the, the reddish or maroon colored squares. Other than that, you can see that we had mostly consistent green across the board for, for most of the others. And the one that I would probably point out that stood out to me personally today was the financials. I was talking about how I personally thought that the financials uh, were starting to become uh, quite attractive from a valuation perspective here in this presentation a week or two ago. And so I am glad to see that snap back here. And what really you know, ignited that was um, from my perspective, what we saw out of Warren Buffett's 13F filing last night, uh, those of you that follow me on Twitter would have seen it already, but uh, in case you haven't heard, uh, Buffett did take a major ownership position in Citigroup, ticker symbol C, and you can see that that is one of them that was lit up the most brightly there in the green. It was up 7.5% today, and remember, that's not a small company. It's a $100 billion company, so that was a pretty aggressive move out of that large bank there, and again, set the tone for all the rest of the banks to head on up uh, as well. So. Um, that was good to see because they, they needed it. Those, those financials were woefully out of favor and many of them got to a very attractive valuation and dividend yields and different things like that that we've actually been concentrating on the financial sector in, my, um, in, the, in the two weeks prior to this week in my dividend growth investing class, we had uh, bought financials two weeks in a row and, and for part of that reason uh, being that they just seemed like they were uh, being ignored by this market a little bit too much and, and so it was good to see that snap back here today. If you wanted to kind of zoom in a little bit further on those two sectors, we can kind of use that breakdown of the public watch lists off on the left hand side here to help us along with that. And so if we go firstly into consumer staples, you can see this is where those red squares reside. For those of you that are watching this video on your YouTube app on your phone, uh, you can probably see these squares a little bit better than when we're looking at all 500 together. So this is only the, the consumer staples here. And again, look at Walmart, just stand out there like a sore thumb. Uh, and then you do see lots of other red coming along the way there as well. A handful of them did manage to close in the green. So, you know, ag-related uh, Archer Daniels Midland, as an example, was able to close in the, in the green there. And then compare that now to the financials. And look at this. It seems like nearly everything was in the green in this case. Let me see if I can find any that were in the red. That one, uh, CME Group, so one of the exchange operators, was down 0.07, so about as close as you can possibly get uh, to break even. So I don't know if you'd even call that a down day, but if you do, uh, I suppose you could say that that was the only financial in the S&P 500 uh, that was down today. All the rest of them, and this remember, this is a big sector, so every financial except for CME, which was effectively flat, was up here today, and uh, many of them up very, very nicely. Capital One also had a very nice 5.6% increase. T. Rowe Price was up about 4% here today. Morgan Stanley was up about 4%. So some really nice snapback rallies that we witnessed today within those financial areas in particular. Let's go ahead and pop on over to the um, normal part of the platform now. And let's take a look at market breadth. And as you can see, it was a landslide victory here for the bulls from this perspective as well. As we counted out, there were about 456 stocks in the S&P 500 that closed in the green here today. So uh, that's about a 91% a hit rate. Uh, it seems like when we've been talking about these overwhelming uh, numbers from this perspective, when I've been doing these videos recently, it's been the opposite direction where we've been talking about how the bears had an overwhelming victory. But today was one of those rare days where the bulls uh, were really taking control of this market uh, with less than 10% uh, of the stocks in the S&P 500 closing in the red today. So uh, very one-sided type of a trading behavior that we saw here today, which was uh, a nice relief rally. Uh, and a lot of people hopefully are getting um, you know, see, seeing some of their losses made up for here with the rally on Friday and then the rally again here today. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the charts now. 
I like to bring up this particular chart here whenever we have a move of at least 1% in either direction. And so today was one of those days to the upside. S&P 500 was up just over 2%. It was 2.02% to be exact. And as you can see, here's what that looks like on this graph where we've got the green line stretching up and over the zero line there in the horizontal black. That green line is stretching all the way up to this horizontal orange. And as you can see in the label, that means that was a 2% up move. So you can kind of get a general sense as to how regular or not that type of a move is. And it, as you can see, we've had a handful of those types of 2% moves here um, over the months, just like we've had a lot of 2% down moves over the month where the, uh, where the um, red line stretches down below the orange line. One thing that I found really interesting by evaluating this chart here today that you might find interesting as well is we are nearly flat year over year. Take a look at the labels up at the top. On the S&P 500, we are down 0.94%. So in other words, we are down less than 1% over the last year. I know that's probably hard to fathom considering how ugly trading has been in recent months, but that's largely because last year into the fall, we had a nice solid uptrend in place and now we've just unwound that. But what I find interesting about that is how it developed. Notice over here when we had this nice healthy uptrend, just steady as she goes, you know, gradually moving its way higher, Notice how quiet these bars were here in the middle of my chart. Those bars didn't hardly ever get to the orange line like we experienced today. In fact, on the upside, the first time we hit the orange line on this chart that looks back over the past year was in uh, December, December 7th. Prior to December 7th, so basically from you know May 17th until December 7th of last year, we didn't have a single day where the market was up 2% like we saw today. Even on the downside, it was relatively quiet. We had one day right here, one random day at the end of September last year, September 28th, where the S&P 500 was down um, right at about 2% that day. But other than that, same thing. You know, you look at that first six months of this one year look back period, and you basically had one day of 2% movement in either direction. Now compare that to the last six months. Basically starting right here on November 26th and onwards to where we're at right now, 2% days have become a bit of a norm. I mean, we are regularly having these stretched movements here. It kind of reminds me of like a Richter scale or something like that, right? Trying to track the movements of an earthquake. And that's effectively what you see here in a visual form, which is why I like to show you guys this, especially those of you who are new and wondering what you got yourself into with the stock market here recently. This can help you identify that what you've been dealing with here in the last month or so is not particularly normal. Um, this back here, perhaps wasn't as normal as you might expect either. So maybe that was somewhat abnormal for how quiet it was. Maybe the truth is somewhere in between, but it is true that in the last year, we have had a dramatic Jekyll and Hyde type of a market where the first half of the year was quiet, uh, you know, and, and just kind of gradually moving to the upside to all time highs. And then the second half of the most recent year has shown the exact opposite, aggressive moves both up and down and trying to shake you out of your positions and trying to keep you up at night worrying about your portfolio. Now naturally with the S&P 500 up nicely today, we did have the VIX fall today. So notice down below here on this purple line, so let me kind of stretch this out so you guys can see this a bit better. Um, notice that the VIX fell down to 26 here today. Remember last week, we were up here at about 34 or 35 at its peak about one week ago, and we've fallen all the way from 34 or 35 down to 26. Now remember, for all of those sold put trades that I've been showing you guys in the last few months, 
this is a beautiful thing. Um, it might not look like it up on the chart up here. You might be thinking, well, geez, if you've been doing a whole bunch of bullish trades, surely you've been struggling in this market environment because all we've had here is just you know a nice little three or four day rally, but we're still down significantly from where we were just two weeks ago. But that's the beauty of that particular strategy that I've uh, gone out of my way to show you guys repeatedly uh, during these presentations. In fact, I was uh, somewhat surprised to learn that all of our trades are making money. Now, that is with the exception of the trade that I did for tonight's video, and I will talk about that later. It's on Constellation Brown Brands, and we're down a whopping $4 on that one. But since we just put that one on today, let's pretend like uh, we're not discussing that one, right? We haven't, got, we haven't given it any time to, to work for us. But every other one of the trades that I've shown you guys here uh, that we still have open are winning trades at this moment in time. Uh, you know, Molson Coors is up 125 bucks. Uh, Best Buy is up uh, 64 bucks. Comcast 22 bucks. J.P. Morgan 38 bucks. Kellogg up 550 bucks. Polaris up 77 bucks. Uh, Philip 66 up 27 bucks. Uh, the Qs, so the NASDAQ ETF, remember we did that sold put trade on the day when we saw the Qs giving us that oversold weekly candle chart. And I'm sure some people thought I was crazy to be doing a bullish trade on the NASDAQ at that time. Well, we're up 116 bucks on that now. Uh, we're up 49 bucks on Starbucks. Uh, we're up 10 bucks on Scott's Miracle Grow. We're up 50 bucks on Stanley Black and Decker. We're up five dollars on Texas Instruments. Remember that one was not a sold put trade. That was actually um, a bear call spread. Uh, but we're even making money on our bearish trades in addition to the bullish ones that I just got done t telling you about. And then we're making 137 dollars there on Whirlpool. So again, I think that's important to point out. In fact, there was someone who told me that um, rather than doing the trade that I showed you guys in the Market Outlook video, uh, instead they chose to buy calls on Scott's Miracle Grow. And I was kind of thinking to myself when I read their comment, like, well, why did you choose to do that? <laughs> Obviously, if I wanted to do that, I would have shown you how to do that. But they were, of course, complaining that they got completely run over on the trade. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I showed you how to sell the put, uh, where we are still doing reasonably well. So we are making money on all of our trades right now. And some people would have a hard time believing that that is true, given the fact that of our 13 open positions prior to tonight's trade, 12 out of those 13 are bullish trades. And we are making money on all of them, all of them, <laughs> in this market environment where it looks like the market is torpedoing lower. So I think that's a valuable lesson, especially for those of you who are newer, um, options provide optionality. Uh, you know, sometimes they get a bad rap because uh, a lot of times people think, well, options are risky. They don't have to be. They can be. So certainly some of their reputation is deserved. But you can also implement option strategies in reasonably safe ways like I think I've tried to show you guys here in the last couple of months. And again, I'm a big put seller myself, so it's something that I take a lot of pride in. And it's something that I show my students every single Monday afternoon in our premium trading rooms at Market Scholar. So if you are somewhat new to the markets and you're wondering how do we go about the process of picking the right stocks for that, the right strike prices, and all the education that goes behind it, I would encourage you to uh, investigate our premium program. Uh, we'd love to have you on board with us here at Market Scholars. Let's go ahead and take a look here now at our four grid chart that we would typically look at to establish what our posture is in the market. And as you can see, this is chart 4B. And despite today's rally across the board, we had nice rallies in all four of these major US equity indices. Despite that, we still have strongly bearish postures according to the market forecast technical indicator. Now, that is likely to change tomorrow unless we have some sort of a major wipeout type of a day, right? If, uh, if the markets do uh, move lower tomorrow, and I think uh, Jerome Powell does speak tomorrow if I'm not mistaken. Maybe that was today, I'd have to double check. But uh, anyway, keep in mind we are in options expiration week. And so you can expect perhaps some more volatility as we head into Friday's close, as the market makers uh, try to aggravate us as much as possible. But um, 
assuming that we don't have some sort of a major meltdown day tomorrow, I'm going to assume that our postures on most of these charts are going to move to weekly bullish. But as of this moment in time, on the close here on uh, Tuesday night, we do remain with those strongly bearish postures. And for those of you that are newer to reading um, these market forecast technical indicator charts, uh, just know that what we are referencing when we, when we say things like what the posture is, is we're talking about this green line in the indicator below the charts. And you can also see there's a label that's associated with that green line. So like with the S&P 500, the intermediate green line, it has a reading here currently of 16.79, and it is currently rising. So in other words, it went up since yesterday. But because it's in what we refer to as the lower reversal zone, and on the market forecast, the lower reversal zone is at 20, then we still consider that to be bearish. Now, the moment it breaks above 20, then our posture would switch to weekly bullish. So if I were to right click on this chart and go to maximize the cell, you can see how close we are to breaking above that 20 line. And the path of least resistance, according to what we see here in the last four days, is bullishness towards the upside. So all else being equal, you can assume that that, that green line is likely to either get right up to 20 or even break through it as soon as tomorrow on the S&P 500. So as you can see here, S&P 500 up 2.02%. It remains below its falling 30-day moving average. It remains currently with a strongly bearish posture, but that has a good chance of changing as soon as tomorrow. Of course, we've already been witnessing these oversold cluster signals. We're now getting that snapback, dead cat bounce type of a rally that we've been anticipating here uh, for a while. But as I mentioned to you guys last week, my expectations, if we can get a really good push, I was hoping we could get up here to like 4275, somewhere around that general vicinity. I remember pointing out these three candles to you guys last week as my hope, my like my long shot goal for the market to get towards the tops of those three candles. But at that time when I was sharing that with you, the moving average was higher. Now that more time has passed, it's given the, uh, the moving average a chance to go lower. And now my, my um, expectations are maybe um, being um, um, a little bit squashed as a result of that. In other words, once we get up to this downward trending 30-day moving average, I wouldn't be surprised if the market gives that as an excuse to roll over. So if we don't get up there as soon as tomorrow, which is highly unlikely, um, then there's a decent chance we may not get to those levels of those candles and we'll just have to deal with what we can get out of the market at that moment. So be on the lookout for that possibility. Moving along now to our next major market, this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Remember, it is our blue chip index, and with a lot of those old school names, uh, like those in the financial world, like JP Morgan doing well uh, here today, um, you did see the Dow Jones rally, as well as a lot of those really oversold you know, um, speculative growth stocks and all that, that you would assume would rally on a big up day like this today as well. But um, we did have plenty of blue chips that were also trying to, to carry their own weight. Dow Jones was up 1.34% today. So not nearly as much as the S&P 500, but still a very solid day. And you can see that we closed near the high of the session. So that's a nice bullish feature there. Uh, you can see that similar to the S&P 500, we're still below the falling 30 day moving average. The green line is still in the lower reversal zone, so it's still considered to be strongly bearish. Remember, for those of you that are newer, you can read the background colors of the charts to help you with that as well. Since it's still dark pink, it's effectively saying that we still consider the posture to be strongly bearish. But as soon as tomorrow, there's a very good chance in the Dow's case, even better so with the Dow than with the S&P 500, because remember the S&P 500's green line was at 16, the Dow's is at 18. So again, it just has to get above 20, and as soon as that happens, then as soon as tomorrow, you're likely to see this background color of the chart change to light green. Now it's still precarious, and remember just because we go to 
um, a weekly bullish posture does not necessarily mean that we expect a bull market from here. It basically means that, hey, the bulls have at least showed up. They stopped just rolling over for the bears. And you can see over here a couple of these attempts where we went to that light green background color. It only lasted for a day or two, and then we were back in the in the in the abyss once again. So don't get too ambitious on that. Uh, a lot of this rebound move has probably already been made. Right, this has been a pretty aggressive move from 31. Thousand on the Dow up here to about 32,600. That's a pretty decent move already. Can we get some more? Sure. Wouldn't be surprised at all if we could rally into Friday's close. But don't expect the world out of this. Don't don't look at a eventual um, weekly bullish posture and think to yourself, oh good, now we're going to break above 35,500 here shortly. That's not my expectation. I'm not saying it can't happen. Obviously, anything is possible. But um, that should not be the way that your first impression of a posture change should be. You need more constructive price activity. And right now, we're still trading closer to um, multi-month lows than multi-month highs. So you have to kind of give the edge to the bears at this moment in time, despite the very nice you know, three or four day rally that we've been uh, a part of here more recently. The next chart on the board is going to be the NASDAQ composite. Similar to the other two, you can see that we're still below that falling 30-day moving average. In the case of the NASDAQ, it did better than both the Dow and the, uh, the S&P 500 today. It was up 2.76%. So solid day there, not a surprise. Remember, uh, the NASDAQ typically is more aggressive on either direction, either to the upside or to the downside, especially in a case like this where it's really been those growth stocks that have torpedoed lower. Naturally, when we have a snapback rally, you should expect the areas that have gotten up that have gotten beaten up the worst to snap back much more aggressively. So that is what we are seeing here. Remember with the NASDAQ, we plotted a lot more of these daily clusters here in the last couple of weeks, uh, more so than what we saw with the Dow and the S&P 500. So we're now seeing the snapback of that taking place. Three out of the last four days, really solid days for the NASDAQ composite, yet we still continue to have strongly bearish posture. With the NASDAQ, it has a worse chance than both the Dow and the S&P 500 to get to the 20 line tomorrow. It's only sitting at 14 right now. It's possible if we have a if we have a decent sized day tomorrow for that to occur, but it's just not quite as likely as what we just witnessed with the other two. And then last but not least, here is the Russell 2000. Huge day out of the Russell. It was up over 3% today. It was up 3.19%. And here's exactly the way we like to look at it. Closing basically at the high of the day, right? Uh, in fact, it was the high of the day if you're at a round up. Um, so uh, it closed technically at a fraction of a cent up here, as you can see. But uh, the high of the day was 1840 spot three. <laughs> and so 1840 spot 298 rounded up is basically saying you closed at the high of the day on the small cap Russell 2000 index. So, so wonderful sign there, right? Not only was it an aggressive percentage move, but it gave you the impression that if the market were open for another hour or two, it very well could have continued to rally. And again, remember today we were uh, seeing extremely strong price activity out of the financials. Some of you might be aware that in the Russell 2000, in the small cap universe, it is chock full of financial stocks. It's probably, if it's not the, uh, biggest sector, it's definitely in the top three. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if the financials are the largest component of the Russell 2000. So with today being a really good day for all those bank stocks, uh, the Russell 2000 had uh, an opportunity to, to show its worth here today as well. But despite that, you can see that it shares the same qualities as all three of the other charts. It's still trading below its falling 30-day moving average, and it's still with a strongly bearish intermediate posture with that intermediate line at 17, it's got a decent chance to get above 20 tomorrow as well. So uh, we could be seeing a whole set of posture changes as soon as tomorrow. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet briefly. 
I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support this presentation. Remember, we don't get paid to do this particular presentation. We don't force you guys to listen to advertising or you know make you sign up for this, that, or the other thing. Uh, you're welcome to listen to it or you're welcome not to. It's up to you. Uh, but we do put a lot of time and energy into it. So if you do want to thank us for doing these videos as often as we do, we simply ask you to click like for us there on Twitter. And as long as we're up and over 100 likes like I was the last time around, I'm happy to do the video for you again at the full length version the next time I do the video, which would include a trade application example. If we're under 100 likes, then you can understand where my enthusiasm to do the videos isn't quite as high, knowing that your guys' enthusiasm to support them isn't quite as high. So in a case like that, I would plan on just doing just a regular 15 minute version of the video, uh, only covering the industry and not doing a uh, trade application example. So uh, thankfully for the last two of you that came in and clicked like, in fact, one of them I think was just right before I started rolling here today. Thank you to those who did that last second. Otherwise, this video would be done already. So uh, to, to, to put a ribbon on it, uh, let's go ahead and say thank you to Jerry and Sedona and Prickly Trader and Hannah and uh, Sherry and Lucius and Thomas and uh, Chris and uh, Ron and Jason and Dean and Ron, Serene, Tom, Edward, DGI and Options Daily, uh, Keith, Claire, Valerie, Ed, Dale, Gerald, Margie, Pam, Paul, Trunk, uh, Elizabeth, David, Carl, Jayesh, Vodacon, Austin, Ken, Dave, William, Rick, Dave, Craig, Dr. Bob, SW, the list goes on and on. I can't get to all of you, but just want you to know that I acknowledge you and I appreciate you. Thank you so much for that. And please continue that if you want to see these free videos doled out to you on the daily. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the sector selector as well. Remember, this gets updated on Friday nights, and so it is a couple of trading days stale at this point, but can still give us a general sense as to what we might be witnessing from a sector rotation perspective. And as you can see here, uh, energy once again leads. I know I sound like a broken record, but there's a reason for it. Uh, you know, they're, they continue to be really strong compared to other sectors out there. And I think it's providing a good lesson as well. I occasionally get people saying, well, when it's already up at the top, it's overbought. And I'm like, no, not necessarily. It can be, but that's why we have to use it in conjunction with other technical analysis. Um, people who would have refused to buy energy stocks three months ago because it was already at the top here in the middle of February just missed a massive gain in energy stocks along the way. So don't let that fool you. Um, we are still interested. Uh, we have a number of oil and gas positions in my top-down trend trading class, and thank goodness we do because there hasn't been a whole lot of other places to hide out that we've uh, felt comfortable with. So um, we still see a lot of positive activity there. That was another thing that um, we saw with Warren Buffett's uh, positions here uh, yesterday. So if I were to go back over to my Twitter profile, uh, one thing, oh, by the way, uh, we got a we got a, uh, 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 an imposter on our Market Scholars um, corporate Twitter handle here today. Uh, those sneaky folks just try to add in an extra S at the end of our normal handle. So uh, thank you, uh, Bailey.Baxter, for helping us along uh, with that there and letting us know about that because I wasn't even aware of it myself before you mentioned it. So I did put together a little uh, graphic here to show you guys how you can go about reporting them if you are so inclined to help us along to get those scammers off the system and make sure they're not trying to impersonate us. Um, here was a tweet that I put out with Berkshire Hathaway. Sometimes you just never know what is going to work on Twitter and what isn't. I was a little bit surprised that this simple tweet here got 647 people to click like on it, but it is quite impactful if you start thinking about how big Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett are. And here are the percentages of entire companies that they own just through the stock market. Remember, this does not even include things like their entire ownership position in Burlington Northern Railroad, or Geico Insurance Company, or Dairy Queen, or Fruit of the Loom. Those are all 100% entirely owned by Berkshire. These are just the portions of the stocks that they own. They own 5% of the entire company of Apple, 12% of Bank of America, 20% of American Express. And here's what I wanted to point out. 
They now own 8% of Chevron and 24% of Occidental Petroleum. So back to you know this graphic of the sector selector, you can see that Buffett has been pushing into the energy patch very aggressively here. And as I kind of explained in one of these presentations maybe a month or so ago, it is my feeling, I, I had a tweet out there that said oil stocks are criminally under-owned by institutions. And I still somewhat feel that way. I feel like there's been such a big ESG movement here uh, in recent years that those who have chose to invest in oil companies have been effectively vilified. And a lot of institutions probably say, I don't need that type of uh, reputation hit. I'm not going to deal with it. Well, they're, they're paying the ultimate price right now because they're probably underperforming if they have zero exposure to oil and gas sector. And so I have this sense that despite oil having done as well as it has this year, there's still a pile of money on the sidelines that could very well find itself into the oil stocks by the end of the year. So uh, Buffett is just one example of that where he has been pushing aggressively into Chevron and Occidental here in recent months. On the downside of the graphic here, I think it was worth pointing out that information technology made a pretty solid move to the upside. That's a good sign. Right, you guys have heard me say in the past that the way that the sector selector is set up right now, I kind of wish it was the exact opposite. In other words, I wish those sectors at the top were at the bottom, and I wish those that were at the bottom were at the top. Because usually, if that's the case, it's showing that there is a risk-taking appetite on Wall Street. Right now, when you've got commodities up at the top and you've got uh, defensive sectors up at the top, it's basically telling you that risk appetite is low compared to if technology and discretionary and communications were up at the top. So I think that was a positive sign there. Whether they'll be able to hold that or not remains to be seen. Of course, we did see today that the financials pop nicely, but this graphic would not have included that because this graphic was put together on Friday. So this upcoming Friday, we'll see if the financials can make a move higher again. But um, having one of those higher beta sectors that we've been seeing languish here recently um, near the bottom, pop up there a couple of slots, I think is a reasonably healthy sign. Uh, I don't think you you bet the, the farm on a, on a move like that or anything, but it has at least one little green shoot, I guess you could say, that maybe just maybe there is something good uh, that is trying to occur underneath uh, the surface. All right, let's get back on track here with our charts. And by the way, I taught my dividend growth investing class here today where we concentrated on the consumer discretionary space and bought a stock that we haven't bought for many, many years. And um, David taught his directional option strategies class. So if you're interested in that and you're a premium member, those recordings are now posted to our calendar. Tomorrow I'll be back in action first thing in the morning with factor-based swing trading. All right, let's go ahead and take a look here at some 12 grid analysis, starting with chart 5A. So as we pull this up here, you can see that we have two green charts on the board, but guess what? They're not the same two that we've been talking about repeatedly. We actually have some change for once. Uh, and that is the US dollar stays the same as what we have been witnessing here lately, uh, where they have had a, a strongly bullish posture. That's still the case. And by the way, the dollar's actually taken a pretty decent sized hit here in the last three trading sessions, at least judging by UUP. You can see we've sold off for three days in a row after collecting those overbought cluster signals, right? That's what that little, those little red dots signify. Remember, those of you that are premium members that have access to all of David and I's charts, if you right click on the 12 grid and go to maximize sell, you can then see the actual technical indicator of the market forecast down below. So there's that, those two red dots back to back on that candle, that candle, telling us that things were a little bit overbought there. And wouldn't you know, immediately after getting back to back overbought cluster signals, we have th a three day losing streak, which we haven't seen for the dollar uh, in quite some time there. So despite that three day losing streak, because there was so much bullish energy built into this chart, we remain with a strongly bullish posture. And I think that should make sense. You know, uh, you look at this chart, it's still easily in an uptrend. So uh, I'm, I for one am kind of glad that it still has a bullish posture despite this, the three day losing streak. We'll see if it can kind of settle in here a little bit above its rising moving average and then maybe catch a bid higher once again. 
The other one that had been green for most of the last few weeks was the one in the other corner, TNX. That's your 10-year US Treasury yield. For those of you that are newer to the Thinkorswim platform, you would move that decimal point on TNX over to the left one to determine what is the current interest rate on the 10-year US Treasury. And in this case, it would be at around 2.97%. So in other words, just a hair below a 3% yield on the 10-year Treasury at this moment in time. Now, TNX was actually up today, so yields were up a, a bit, but because they had fallen in, let's see, it would have been five out of the previous six trading days, um, there was enough wear and tear on the price um, to actually switch the posture. Now, notice that the background color is light pink as opposed to like dark pink, like you see with Bitcoin just above it. And what that signifies is that is a weakly bearish posture, not a strongly bearish one. Again, if I right click on the chart and go to maximize sell, you can see that this green line has fallen out of the upper reversal zone, which is at 80 on the market forecast indicator, and has continued to drift lower, but is not spiking lower. Because it remains above the 50th percentile, we are basically just saying, hey, there is a little bit of bearishness that's creeping into it, but we're not gonna go overboard by calling this just straight out strongly bearish. If it can get below 50, then you know that'll change. But right now, we're gonna make the assumption that it's going to probably try to catch a little bit of a bounce right here, if anything. That's at least my assumption with it trading above its rising moving average. But if that's not the case, of course, we'll report back to you here, as we always do uh, with these daily videos. Uh, so pretty decent little bounce in, in yields today, but not enough to push the intermediate posture back to bullish. So the other chart that was green, that was not last time I did the video for you, that is green now, uh, is um, oil. Now, oil's kind of been going back and forth. Um, you know, we, we had, of course, a huge run up in oil prices during the Russia Ukraine news. Um, and then we kind of settled in here more recently. And, um, you know, a week or so ago, it had that light pink background color. But as I was telling you at the time, um, I, for one, would have given them the benefit of the doubt. And again, I know some people just truly hate energy and anything related to oil and gas. And I don't know what to tell you if that's the case. Uh, I'm happy uh, that you're, you're, you, you know, you're standing up for our environment and all that. And believe me, I love our uh, nature and the environment. I, I love hiking in the mountains and all that kind of stuff. So uh, remember, I've got to, I've got to learn how to kind of separate uh, what I think out there in the real world versus what I do as my career here as, you know, an investor and as a trader. And right now, uh, those are some of the only areas, quote unquote, working. And so so despite oil having traded a bit below its moving average, I was saying, you know what, I want to give it the benefit of the doubt because every time in the past it had pulled back to that moving average or even gone below it was a time to buy oil, not to sell oil. And of course, that is exactly what happened once again. Now, oil was down today. It was down 2.4%. But because of this four-day rally we had prior to it, there was enough positive energy there where we are back to that strongly bullish posture on oil. Now, compare that to gold because this has been um, one of the bigger conundrums of recent weeks where we've had quite the difference there between those two charts. A lot of times commodities do travel together. Not always, but more times than not, they kind of react to the US dollar the same way. We're in a moment right now where that's just not the case. It seems like the oil complex is holding up a bit better than some of the other commodities out there. And gold, which is a, an area that you you would figure would do quite well in an inflationary environment, has actually started burning people. Uh, in other words, treating them poorly uh, when at the exact time when they thought they needed gold the most. Uh, and so that probably is not that comfortable of a feeling. We know that to a degree because we do have some exposure to gold in my top-down trend trading class. And so we're kind of dealing with those emotions to a degree right now. And I imagine uh, we probably won't be staying in that position all that much longer. Uh, but uh, you know that just goes to show you that the markets continually surprise you. And in this high inflationary environment, we actually saw gold roll over. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. 
we have been plotting a lot of these oversold cluster signals, these green dots here in the last couple of weeks. So just maybe we can get a little bit of a snap back to the upside in gold. Now, the question will be what it does when it gets to the moving average, similar to the conversation I had with you about the market itself, the S&P 500. Assuming that you believe in the concept of a, tr a trend is your friend until the end, your assumption right now should be if we get a snapback rally in gold, it's probably a time to lighten up on your bullish positions in that area and or uh, put on bearish trades there. So, um, you know, maybe that'll change, but right now you kind of have to go into it with that assumption. We did see, of course, with treasury yields up today, most bond prices were down. So TLT, which tracks long-term US treasuries, was down 1.21%. It remains with a strongly bearish posture. Foreign bonds were down 0.59%, also strongly bearish posture. And then high yield bonds were down 0.09%, also strongly bearish posture. And notice that high yield bonds are basically right there at their multi-month, probably multi-year lows. Not a great sign there, right? High yield bonds are the more speculative area of the bond market. And when you have a big robust up day like we had in the stock market today, it's a risk taking type of, a, 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 of an atmosphere. You would expect that maybe high yield bonds could catch a little bit of a bid, but they did not. <laughs> and so that's not a good sign. That's not something you can put in the bullish camp in terms of data points there. Um, in terms of our foreign stock markets up above here, we had some pretty robust moves, including EEM up 2.45%. That's the emerging markets. Part of that is as a result of a lot of Chinese companies having really strong rebounds today, even more so than US stocks in many cases, partially due to um, some, some rumors and some stories floating around that China is going to loosen its grip on its COVID lockdown that it's been struggling through right now. And so that provided a little bit of levity to Chinese stocks, which then provided some much needed levity to the entire category of emerging foreign stocks. Um, the developed foreign stocks, EFA, was up 1.86% here today. Both of them remain below falling 30-day moving averages. And just like here in the United States, both of them continue to have strongly bearish postures. Let's go ahead and take a look now at our sector 12 grid. And this will be chart 5C for those of you following along at home. As we pull this up, things are looking a little bit better than they did the last time I was with you on Thursday. Uh, at that point, we had basically all the charts in pink. Uh, now we've got a few of those green charts back. And of course, no surprise at all, we are being led by energy in terms of intermediate posture. Notice the dark green background color with energy as opposed to the light green with materials, utilities, and staples. Now, if that sounds familiar, it probably should. We just got done reviewing the sector selector that showed energy, staples, utilities, and materials. And for those of you that are curious, I know most of my premium members that attend my classes are aware of this, but some of you that only watch these free videos may not. This graphic here, the sector selector, has nothing to do with the market forecast technical indicator. So it's just merely by coincidence that those two things are telling us the exact same things right now. So it's basically confirming one another's um, you know, data and analysis, I guess you could say. So energy, of course, continues to be our leader. In fact, it hit multi-year highs today. And remember, that was in the face of falling oil prices. Oil stocks were up significantly, up over 1% on a day when oil itself was down 2%. So a really strong sign there for energy stocks today and the strength that they continue to have and that they've had all year long. Materials had a pretty solid day as well. As you can see, they were up 2.8%. Uh, they were second only to technology, which was up 2.9%. So technology led today, materials were second, and then financials came in third. All of them up well over 2.5%. And you can throw consumer discretionary in that conversation as well. They were just barely up over 2.5%. So strong day in some key areas of the market. But unlike those other charts that I just mentioned, in the case of materials, 
we are now back to the weekly bullish postures. The others remain bearish for the time being. So uh, materials did not go down as aggressively as those other, others. And that should make some sense, right? If you were just to kind of squint your eyes and only look at the moving averages themselves instead of the price candles, notice how the materials shape of the moving average looks with a healthy portion in the middle in the green, and then compare that to technology. And look at the difference in the shape of that moving average and then compare that to the shape of the moving average on the financials and on discretionary right we actually had a, a strong upward ascent here on materials which means yes they've struggled in the last few weeks but because they were in an uptrend prior to struggling they've really just given back their gains whereas those other sectors are piling on additional losses as time goes on so since materials is not piling on additional losses and is just merely giving back their gains when they get a strong snapback like we saw today they are going to be more likely to switch back to a weekly bullish posture as we saw here today utilities and staples also have weekly bullish postures but as i mentioned before staples were actually down today they were the only sector down today as a result of the meltdown in uh, in walmart stock um, utilities were actually up over 1% today. Both of them remain below their moving average, as is the case with materials. So at this moment in time, the only sector that's trading above its moving average is energy. Uh, that's really saying something right there. So it's you can see that despite the enthusiasm from the bulls in the last few sessions, um, we still have a lot of work to do if we want to be looking at constructive and bullish charts. Uh, it still looks like a mess out there if you're not looking at energy. All right, so um, I thought we would get into our trade application example now. And I had mentioned um, Molson Coors uh, earlier as uh, we are still making money on that trade despite their downgrade today. So we kind of got some unlucky news on a big bullish day on Molson Coors. But despite the downgrade, we're still making um, a good percentage on that particular swing trade. But oddly enough, I'm kind of going back into the same area. In other words, alcoholic beverage space. And what we'll be doing, as uh, you probably saw the sneak peek of here earlier, is a trade on Constellation Brands. Now, um, Molson Coors is the company, of course, behind Molson and Coors and Coors Light and Blue Moon and Killian's Red and all that good stuff. Um, Constellation Brands is a little bit of a different company where it's not readily apparent in the name of the company what al alcoholic beverages they tap into, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the core um, beer brands that they own are Mexican beer brands like Corona and Pacifico, one of my favorites, uh, and Modelo and uh, a few others. And so that's kind of their, their, their core uh, area of focus. They do own some other uh, spirits and wine brands as well, but um, it seems like Corona and the popularity of, of Corona, Corona Light in the last decade or so is really what has kind of put them on the map. So um, let's go ahead and just pull up how about uh, our, our swing trading chart 3A and the ticker symbol for Constellation Brands is STZ. So Sam, Tom, Zorro. And um, you can see here that despite the consumer staples doing poorly today, Constellation Brands didn't get caught up in that. And remember that is actually kind of saying something there. Remember when we were looking at that on the heat map, Let's go back over here for a second and look at consumer staples. Most consumer staples were down today. That's the only sector we can say that about. Yet despite most of the components in the consumer staples being red on this hugely green day, STZ, Constellation Brands, was one of them that managed to avoid that fate, which effectively is telling you that there is some pent up strength within that name. If, if they are doing something that is largely different than most of their other components within that sector, then there's some kind of hidden or embedded strength that perhaps not everybody else is recognizing. The other thing that I would point out about Constellation is if we pop back over here to the internet and go back to the Market Scholars website here 
uh, briefly. I wanted to show you our stock selector tool that we use for my Monday top down trend trading class. And you can see here on the default uh, tab, the, st the stock rank tab, that constellation STZ is ranked 103rd out of 1000 stocks on our radar. Um, as of Friday night, it probably even improved more um, in the last couple of days. But at that time, it was in kind of that upper 10% threshold type of an area, right? Just outside of that. So upper 11%, I guess you could say. Um, so anyway, it is an outstanding performer on a relative strength basis, which is kind of what this tool is designed to point out. But not only that, is it a strong performer by itself, but as you can see, it belongs to the consumer staples sector, which is currently number two out of 11, and it belongs to the beverages industry that is currently number five out of 68. Since all of those are ranked in the top thirds of their respective categories, that's why you see that particular line listed in green all the way across to let us know that that is a stock that would meet the basic rules that I teach in my Monday top-down trend trading class. Another part of this tool is this other tab down below that's called the Stock Rank History tab. And I also wanted to show you that we've seen an improvement in relative strength using this tab on STZ as well. Again, there's STZ kind of listed there where I'm circling with my mouse in the pink background color, ranked number 103 this week. But if we go back in time, you can see that we've had a positive color change, um, which is basically a way to point out to us that we've seen an improvement in relative strength. This is not talking about absolute strength. This is effectively a way to recognize relative strength through another visual format known as this stock selector tool that we use for my class. And so you can see, for instance, back here on February 18th, Constellation was ranked 664th out of 1,000. And then it started its journey higher. In fact, if you go back even further, you can see it was actually in the red. In other words, in the bottom third way back here in the fall of last year. But that's going back quite far. Even in the more recent history, it was kind of considered a more neutral uh, performer. And so for about two months there, from the middle of February till the beginning of April, it was in that neutral yellow category, which is basically just average. And then starting the first or second week of April, it jumped into the green category, was ranked 215th out of 1,000, and has now made its way all the way up to 103. So that's a positive sign there as well if you're looking for stocks that have exhibited relative strength during this very difficult market that we found ourselves in here recently. So as far as the trade that I did here today, all I did was a basic swing trade in this particular case. In other words, I bought shares of stock, I put my stop loss below some of the lows in the last couple of weeks, I'm doing a one for one reward risk relationship where my upside price target is up here just a hair below 260. So in other words, buying it for the reason of it bouncing up and off of this rising 30 day moving average and the blue background color is stating that we now have a bullish near-term posture in addition to the green intermediate posture also being bullish at the time. Obviously, the stock has easily outperformed the S&P 500 over the last three months of this chart as well. So with all of that in mind, this is a company that has strength not only by itself, but through its sector and its industry as well. So we're just buying some shares here with the hope that this can bounce up and off that moving average if it heads back to that prior high before needing to break through uh, and, and establish a brand new high, we would be taking our profits before we get to that level. On the other hand, if this fails and it rolls over and the whole stock market's struggling here in coming weeks, then we will be stopped out below some of these recent lows um, over the last few weeks. And remember, if you needed the specific details in terms of the, um, the, 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 the price target and the stop losses, Remember, for those of you that are premium members, I already did this trade while the market was open today. I did it at the end of the day here today, and I sent out the Telegram information uh, that shows the screenshots and uh, gives you the heads up as to where the actual levels are with the stop losses and the target prices. So make sure you take advantage of that if you are one of our premium members here at Market Scholars. All right, that's what I had for you here tonight. I hope you got value out of this presentation. It was a glorious day for the bulls up over 2%, but let's not get 
uh, too uh, ambitious here. Let's remind ourselves that despite the really strong rally, we continue to have a lot of really ugly looking charts out there. So we are thankful that some sort of a snapback recovery rally has established itself, but let's not all the mat automatically assume that it's going to lead to higher highs or lead to a trend change. We still have to be quite guarded in this type of vulnerable market environment that we find ourselves in. If you got value out of tonight's video, I ask one simple request out of you. Trade in the three hours that I spent working on this video today for your five seconds in time to say thank you for putting this together by simply clicking like for me there on Twitter. As long as we're up at over 100, I'll plan on doing another full-length video for you on Thursday. So until next time, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.